Hello and welcome to this presentation on the Battle of Agincourt 1415. Now few nations are better at boasting about their history than the English and they're very fortunate to have a very skilled boaster among them. I talk of course about Shakespeare whose play Henry V is an epic telling of an epic tale. Henry V really was a charismatic leader but if your understanding of this part of history is dictated by Shakespeare's play then you might be glad to hear that Shakespeare actually got quite a few things right. But of course, much else is mythology. So let's find out about the truth about the Agincourt campaign and the battle itself. We'll see how Henry raised his army, what challenges he faced, and how he finally managed to defeat the French on their own ground on the field of Agincourt on that dark day in October of 1415. So let's go once more unto the breach, dear friends, once more and have a look at how Henry raised his army. First of all, let's get some context about the Agincourt campaign of 1415. This was one campaign in a much wider and longer war called the Hundred Years' War. So called, as historians have recognised, that this war actually lasted over 100 years. It was really just a fight between the King of England, who also wanted to be the King of France, and the King of France, who didn't want to stop being the King of France. At this time, the King of England was Henry V, pictured. There's a reason why he's facing that way, which we'll come back to in a moment. The King of France at this time was called Charles. Um, unfortunately, he was quite mad and thought he was made of glass, but we won't dwell on that. Henry was a young king in 1415 who wanted to win glory by capturing land in France. But he did have problems, not least of which that many of his own nobility were a little bit wary of him. After all, his father had, shall we say, stolen the throne some years earlier, and Henry had yet to prove himself. His more immediate problems, however, were that he had very little money, that he had very few soldiers, and that he had no secure bases in France. Sure, the English controlled Calais at this time, but if he wanted to venture further into France itself, he needed a base much more south than that. So he came up with a rather cunning plan to get around these problems. First of all, he was going to secure a base of operations at Harfleur in Normandy. This would provide him with a secure base that was defendable, and that also had a port for receiving reinforcements and supplies ideal. Secondly, he was going to raise an army of 12,000 men by asking his nobles, which he appointed as captains, to provide soldiers. These would be guaranteed by indentures, which was a sort of paperwork to make sure that the men that they promised would turn up actually did turn up, a little bit like a school register. We'll come back to those in a moment. While this is only a medium-sized army for the time, what made it even more different was its composition. 9,000 of those soldiers would be cheap but powerful longbowmen. Now Henry, and this is where we come back to the picture at the top, Henry had every reason to know about the power of the longbowmen. While his father, Henry IV, was on campaign, and indeed trying to secure his throne, the 16-year-old Henry joined him at the Battle of Shrewsbury. Here, both sides used the longbows to devastating effect. The young Prince Hal was hit and just below his, uh, his right eye by an arrow. He very nearly was killed, but through a bit of expert surgery he was saved, but he had a very disfiguring scar on that side of his face. That probably made him look pretty terrifying, but it was actually very, very good at showing that he had experience in battle and that he had shown his bravery before. Nevertheless, Henry there was uh, very keen not to show this in his official portrait, although it seems he wasn't quite so worried by his bowl cut haircut. Lastly, Henry uh, intended to solve the problem of having very little cash. He would pay his men using plunder gained from the campaign. As they moved through the French countryside raiding, uh, they would be able to steal treasure and then share it between the company. One third would be kept by the king. He is in charge, after all. One third would be shared between the captains, who would have each been re uh, rewarded handsomely that way, and the rest of the third would have been for the men. Now, if that sounds rather unfair, well, it was. But very often, armies were not paid at all at this time, especially the more lowly uh, ranks within the army. So this was a, an attractive prospect, if a bit of a gamble for those who were going to take part. Let's see how things actually went. For Let's have a look at one of Henry's indentures. The original Agincourt rolls, as the indentures are now known, actually survive. And so we've got a very good idea of both how many people were in the army, but also the individual names of many of those who took part. This was incredibly unusual. In the Middle Ages, most of the time, it was just the nobility whose names were recorded. Here's some details to note, though. First of all, we can see Thomas Erpingham's name at the top. He was appointed the captain, 
Underneath, we can see the names of all the rest of his retinue, his esquires, his archers and others. You'll notice on the left, there's a sort of dog-toothed zigzag design. That's because this was made of parchment and it was a double copy. So one part would be snipped off with a distinctive zigzag design, the other kept by uh, Thomas Irving and himself, the other kept by the king. And when the campaign started, the two copies would be reunited together and it could be checked that no forgery had been made. Because if the dog tooths fitted together, you knew that Thomas Erpingham had in fact brought all the men that he had promised. This would also be used for sharing out the plunder. But despite doing this, and despite his best planning, not everything was going to go to plan. Henry's plan began to unravel really at the first hurdle. Remember he was going to secure a base of operations at Harfleur in Normandy. Well, this he succeeded in doing, but not quickly. It took around six weeks to accomplish this. During this time, all the supplies that they had brought with them were exhausted, so the soldiers resorted to eating the shellfish outside of the city. Unfortunately, the oysters, mussels and other shellfish outside were, were filtering the sewage out of the city. This made the men very sick indeed. Although uh, Henry did succeed in bringing 12,000 men along, he didn't manage to keep them all. Many of them died of their wounds or of dysentery outside of Harfleur. By the time they took Harfleur, Henry had lost about a third of his strength. Lastly, Henry had promised to pay his men using plunder. Unfortunately, campaigning season was coming to an end by the time uh, Harfleur had been captured, and so Henry's priorities had changed. He now needed to get his surviving army back to Calais, and then back home and safety. And he had to do this before the roads became impassable with the uh, autumn storms and the winter weather. Henry's priority was now to try and get home at any cost. And given that he could only transport his men on foot, this was no mean feat. Have a look at this map. Note that Henry's men start at Harfleur. They then march north towards Calais and are making good progress before a French army blocks their crossing at the Somme. Here they have to play a game of cat and mouse against the pursuing French army. They move more and more inland along the river Somme and then finally manage to cross it. Just as they think they've given the French the slip, they meet them at Agincourt. The French block their way. Henry is left with only two options. He either stands and fights or he surrenders. Henry knew that he was unlikely to survive standing and fighting. And yet he also knew that there would be great dishonour in surrendering and many of his men would not make it home. He chose the confident route of standing and fighting. He had some reasons to be confident, and this is partly shown in the place where the fight happened. Now, on the next screen, I'm going to show you a battle map. Those of you who may have seen my Falkirk uh, video from before will know that I draw these maps on Microsoft Paint. Uh, therefore, their quality is not high. Nevertheless, I hope it will give you a clear idea of the layout of the battle. As for the animations, I can only apologise. You'll see. So the Battle of Agincourt began on the 25th of October 1415, right towards the end of the campaigning season. Here's our battlefield. So the main parts of the battlefield are Agincourt on the left, Tramcourt on the right, and Maisoncelle to the south. Henry was moving up the main road to Calais in the middle. In the centre of the battlefield were ploughed fields between Tramcourt and Agincourt. These had been recently ploughed in preparation for next year's planting. As was typical in October, there had been quite a bit of rain, so these ploughed fields had soaked up an awful lot of this mud. Some years ago, I went on a visit to the Somme region whilst visiting the First World War battlefields, and I have to say that the soil there is uniquely sticky. It gets all over your boots and is very, very heavy. I would not want to fight a battle in these conditions, especially not as an attacking force. Henry recognised this and decided to try and turn it to his advantage. Let's have a look at the English deployment. Henry decided, in an aggressive move, to move his men forward and basically taunt the French into an early attack. The triangles represent Henry's longbowmen, very powerfully built men. He then positioned three units of dismounted men-at-arms in the centre. Now, these men are not standard infantry. These are the sorts of no nobility in plate armour who would otherwise have been fighting on horseback. But Henry recognised that in a defensive situation with these ploughed fields, they would be better off fighting on foot. Henry also demanded that his archers cut down branches from the surrounding woodlands and hammer stakes into the ground. 
He knew that the archers might be at dire risk of being run down by French cavalry, so in order to break down and slow down their attack, they hammered these stakes into the ground. These worked a little bit like static pikes. If you've seen the video on the Battle of Falkirk, you'll know just how effective pikes are against cavalry, and they are likely to have been quite effective in warding off the French cavalry. In terms of the numbers, Henry had 2,000 dismounted knights in his centre in three sections. He had 6,000 archers on his flanks for a total of around 8,000 men. He deliberately selected this boggy ploughed field bordered with woodland because he knew it would cause a bottleneck for the French attacking. This might slow them down, but also it presents his archers with an even easier target. Notice as well that some of Henry's archers are hidden in the woodlands. Here they can fire into the sides or flanks of the French army, and indeed some of the closest archers were able to gall or taunt the French into attacking without discipline. Speaking of which, let's have a look at the French army. Now, I have simplified certain things about this. I've not included the French crossbowmen, for example. Much is often said about how superior the longbow is to the crossbow. Well, the crossbow is easier to use, it's a very powerful weapon, but actually it plays a relatively small role in the Battle of Agincourt. I've chosen to ignore it just for simplicity's sake. I've also ignored the fact that the French apparently brought some early artillery along with them, but at this time cannon were not especially effective in these situations and were more useful for scaring horses than they were for really killing men. The French had an enormous section of infantry. This would have been both standard infantry and dismounted knights, much as the same as the English were using. They had sections of cavalry as well. Again, these cavalry were incredibly well trained, but they fought more as individuals and nobility. They were not the disciplined force that Henry had brought with him. What is pretty well certain, though, is that the French massively outnumbered the English. There are some sources that suggest there were 36,000 French soldiers at Agincourt compared to the 8,000 that Henry had brought with him. While this might be another case for medieval exaggeration, it is likely that there around 1,500 were mounted knights and the rest were men at arms uh, in plate armour and other forms of armour. A more realistic figure might be between 10 and 15,000 men, maybe getting up towards 20,000, but they still outnumbered Henry quite substantially. After galling the French soldiers into attack, the French cavalry charged. The French attack was a mess. The cavalry got bogged down into the, uh, in the ploughed field. The uh, stakes also warded them into the centre, and as they got tighter and tighter packed together, they were hit by powerful arrows fired by, or rather loosed, by the longbowmen. Now, you can do a quick bit of maths here, but if there are 6,000 longbowmen, and it takes them about a minute to get to the front lines while they're in range, then around 18,000 arrows would have been fired at that first French attack. That must have been like facing machine gun fire. Now, whether or not these arrows could really pierce the armour of the French knights, what they could do is terrify them, wind them, and also break up their formations. And the less that we think about what happened to the poor horses in all of this, probably the better. The charge was defeated, and it was humiliated, and it did retreat. At virtually the same time as the French cavalry were retreating, they retreated straight into the faces of the advancing French infantry. At this stage, the infantry were in for pretty well the same reception that the cavalry got. Again, note how rubbish my animations are here. Sorry about that. However, what it does illustrate is that the infantry were attacked from all sides by these arrows. By the time they got as far as the English lines, the fresh English dismounted knights were able to dispatch them one after the other. The French were increasingly exhausted, their heavy army, armour weighing them, them down in the boggy mud. And by the time they got to the English lines, they were hardly in a position to fight. Also, human nature dictated that they would have bunched together. It is very likely that you've got something approaching a crowd disaster going on here, with men being literally crushed to death, not just bludgeoned by English axes and halberds. At this stage, though, Henry was himself in pretty desperate danger. He was in the thick of the fighting. I am sure that Shakespeare's Henry V very much emphasises the point that he was a great leader and a great speaker. Nobody knows exactly what he said that day, and it's unlikely to have been quite as inspiring as Shakespeare's wonderful St Crispin's Day speech, but he was an inspiring leader. His men saw him fighting in the thick of it, a, a part of his circlet or crown on his helmet was cut from him, and Henry was almost killed on three separate occasions, but he managed to survive, and the French were on the, the receiving end of most of the losses.
As Henry recognised that the French were about to break, he commanded his longbowmen to place down their bows to pick up whatever weapons they could find, be they swords, be they axes, or be they the mallets that they hammered the stakes into the ground with, and to set upon the stranded French. This would have been a bloody free-for-all, and the French were utterly routed. The losses here would have been absolutely catastrophic. Around 7,000 French soldiers were killed, and only about 1,500 were captured. Not only that, but Henry had no way of imprisoning these men. So normally, while it would have been profitable to take all these noble prisoners uh, back to England and ransom them, Henry ordered them executed. Many of these executions were done with these misericord daggers like the one pictured. These were carried by many of the soldiers and placed through the visors of the helmets or other gaps in the armour as a way of offering mercy, which is what misericord means in Latin, to the poor people trapped inside. Interestingly, Henry was not criticised at the time for killing all of these prisoners, something that today we would see rather as a war crime. Not even the French were criticised him for this. It was recognised that he didn't really have the facility to take prisoners and that his priorities were to get his men back to England. I suppose it's difficult sometimes to look at these events with our modern eyes and try and excuse them. Nevertheless, the English had won a famous victory. In around three hours, they had managed to not only kill and capture all of those French, but they had only lost around 450 men of their own. It was often seen as a miracle. Henry seems to have suggested that the English should not give thanks to each other, but instead give thanks to God for the victory something that uh, Shakespeare includes in his play. So let's have a look at some of the outcomes and a summary. Henry's decision to bring many archers paid off. He chose a good position and he used them aggressively. By selecting an area of bottlenecked ploughed fields, he was able to funnel the French into a killing zone where his arrows were devastatingly effective. Not only that, but his advanced archers are the ones who managed to taunt the French into an early attack. Henry's dismounted knights were disciplined and inspired by the bravery of their king. On the other hand, the French fought very much as individuals. Their discipline was very much lacking, and they paid the price. The French attack across the ploughed field was rash, and it lacked all discipline. As they became exhausted and confused, surrounded by the dead and the dying, they were easily picked off, not only by the English dismounted knights, but eventually by the longbowmen too. Henry was also ruthless. He was fighting to survive. He was not trying to secure ransom. This meant that when the time came, he could have taken prisoners, but he would have been unable to secure them with so small a force. He took a controversial decision to kill them all, but he did take his men back to England. And so, the story of the Agincourt campaign and Henry V is an inspiring one. Shakespeare wrote it into an epic play, and even today it's still made into films. The recent Netflix film, The King, follows the Agincourt campaign and Henry V, though it should be noted that this is very much more a modern retelling of the Shakespearean Henry V tale rather than a true history. The Battle of Agincourt here only bears some relationship to the real battle, but it's still worth a look if you want to get a sense for what a hail of longbow arrows would look like. And so on that note, gentlemen in England now abed shall think themselves a curse they were not here and hold their manhoods cheap whilst any speaks that fought with us upon St Crispin's Day. Or at least watch this YouTube channel. If you enjoyed it, like and subscribe, and I hope you found it helpful. Goodbye!